great to be here in Berlin, and I am excited to tell you about the serverless first mindset and how I approach uh, both building serverless applications and working with companies to make sure that we're making the best decisions in our organization in terms of serverless, in terms of building applications. So uh, my name is Jared Short. Um, I did work uh, at Trek 10 uh, since 2015. Trek 10 is a Amazon Web Services consulting partner, advanced consulting partner. We specialize in building um, serverless applications. I also was one of the first people to contribute to what is now called the serverless framework. Uh, it was called something else prior to that. I worked at the serverless framework for a little bit as the head of developer experience. Um, and now I'm back at Trek 10 helping people learn and build serverless applications again. Um, I think I'm a little bit uniquely uh, positioned to talk about this because I was also the first person that was ever Amazon authorized consultant and a Docker authorized consultant. And you can see how that went. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what I want to what I want to do is since a lot of us here, I think, are, are builders and doers and, and programmers, uh, I like to kind of establish rules for how I build systems. So this is kind of the, the, the serverless first uh, flow diagram, right? I have a design, I have an application I want to build. Uh, can you make it serverless? If the answer is no, my response typically to those organizations and people is try harder. And if they say, okay, can you make it serverless now? And they keep saying no, I keep saying try harder. Uh, and eventually you get to a yes, or I just say, okay, this is clearly not worth doing. We're going to skip it. Uh, so that's not, <laughs> that's not necessarily true, but... Uh, this is really, truly how I approach a lot of this stuff. But there is a few other rules that I like to put in place that make this a little more intuitive than just saying, keep trying harder. So uh, I would like to thank Eric, uh, actually, for bringing up GraphQL. So the way we're going to talk about the serverless first mindset is I'm going to present you with various use cases, various real life things that I have built that have shipped to production. And we're going to talk about how they were built and maybe why I would have done them a different way. So GraphQL is, of course, a way uh, for modeling both uh, how people access your data, so via an API, a schema, and it's also a runtime engine for parsing those queries and fetching data. So the way it kind of looks to a client, you have a well-defined schema, and they are able to pull in all of this information about your API. It makes, there's fantastic public tooling around GraphQL. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's easy to traverse that, that graph and people can fetch exactly what they need. Your backend API exacts, understands exactly what people are asking for. You are able to pass back only exactly what they asked for. So GraphQL is, in my experience, a, a pretty great way to actually expose your data and APIs to people. But what about serverless in GraphQL? Why am I even talking about GraphQL here? Well, so serverless, uh, you get all of these normal wins from serverless. So I primarily use AWS Lambda, but the serverless guarantees and, and wins really do apply to most of the, the FAS providers out there, right? You get scalability and availability. You can do multi-region things. Uh, you get all of the power of GraphQL when you mesh these two things together. You get uh, the capability for clients to ask for exactly what they want. Uh, but then, once you mesh these two technologies together, really what you end up with is smoothing out some of those complicated and rough edges, right? So there's a really interesting uh, kind of attack on functions as a service system, serverless systems, and then also GraphQL um, called resource exhaustion attacks, where essentially I can ask for deeply nested graphs with GraphQL, and I can try to make your systems take a long, long time to return me data. And at that point, it's both a resource exhaustion attack. You can try to chew up the amount of functions that someone might have available in their literal AWS account. If they say a thousand concurrent functions, you can try to make sure that all of those thousand functions are running for the maximum amount of time, 30 seconds or something like that. And it's also kind of called a, a denial of like wallet attack, uh, where you're just trying to cost someone as much money as possible. Um, so there's some really easy ways to mitigate that with GraphQL and serverless, right? I can just say, well, any request that's going to take longer than five seconds on my function is an invalid request, and we're just not going to return it to that person. And you get some really quick, easy ways around some of those complicated problems. 
And then also you get some complex resolvers. And we're going to talk about an architecture that I actually built. Uh, this is for a, a, a client that wanted GraphQL. And they had tons and tons of back-end systems that they were communicating with. So we had an API gateway that was actually running to a Lambda function that had a GraphQL engine in it. So this engine is, uh, this runtime engine is parsing all of these requests coming in. And then behind the scenes, it would actually federate out to more Lambda functions. And these Lambda functions would go to DynamoDB, uh, an actual relational database service. Uh, and so this was kind of one of those situations where it was maybe a little bit of a monolith that was distributed. So we got into that complicated distributed monolith situation that Eric talked about. But we were able to isolate some of those problems and say, you know, just put another Lambda function in front of the REST API and we'll pretend it's now GraphQL. And to the perspective of the developers that were using this and the people that were hitting this GraphQL endpoint, uh, it didn't see all this complexity behind the scenes. We were able to add additional resolvers and additional ways that people were able to access their data without making it too complicated on the developers in the front end. So if I were to rate this architecture today and we were to talk about it in a room with businesses today, I'd basically say, fail. This is, this is a horrible idea. Don't do it. Um, and the reason is probably not what you think. But this leads me to kind of my, my first rule uh, of kind of the builder's creed of serverless that I have, which is if the platform has it, use it. So AWS has recognized that GraphQL is a really, really uh, strong way to present your APIs to, to developers. So as they recognized this, they said, okay, we don't want people to keep necessarily building GraphQL behind the API gateway through a Lambda function with all of these other resolvers that are Lambda functions. Instead, they released a service called AWS AppSync, right? So this is a fully managed GraphQL endpoint where you just hand it your schema and they say, okay, here's your GraphQL endpoint. Uh, and, and then they, they give you all of these tools uh, to do code-defined infrastructure, to do a code-defined GraphQL endpoint. You get all sorts of great security in place. Uh, it does all of the complex resolver stuff that I've been talking about. And uh, really, in many cases, uh, we get minimal code that we actually have to manage. So using that platform service, I'm able to reduce my overall risk and, and management burden on more complicated business logic that I don't necessarily want to be responsible for. So if the platform has it, use it. It's definitely one of my first suggestions, right? Uh, you wouldn't build your own blob storage anymore. You would use S3 or, or, or Azure uh, blob storage, things like that. So don't build it if the platform already has it. So the second thing I would like to talk about is kind of the hollow world of serverless, of course, which is dynamic image resizing. And we were working with a client and they said, okay, we have all of these images and we need thumbnails. And then we need uh, also maybe smaller versions for mobile. Uh, maybe we need some other additional um, capabilities uh, in an image resizing system. So using our uh, pl use platform services, right? Uh, we wanted to make sure that we could leverage as many platform services po as possible that we weren't building too much business logic and that we were handing off all of these complicated parts uh, of an otherwise uh, complicated application just to the cloud providers, right? We wanted all the scaling, scaling, the security. We wanted less total cost of ownership. So, you know, our shared responsibility model in, in the cloud, this is the traditional shared responsibility of the cloud, right? Uh, for AWS, they'll manage basically everything from you know, their data centers, plugging stuff in, making sure it stays up the power, all the way up to kind of like base level software. And from there, then, it's the client's responsibility to worry about your networking configurations, uh, making sure that you're using the correct server side encryption, all of that stuff. This is complicated. And while this is a, a massive improvement over managing your own data center, it wasn't nearly as awesome as when we moved to platform services. Once we move to platform services, you'll see the red line. We get to stop caring about everything below that red line for the most part. All I have to really worry about is my applications, maybe some identity and access management, my customer data, and my business logic. So uh, we're building this dynamic image resizing system. Uh, and I did some poking around. And as I was building it out, I said, 
you know what, I think I can do this in, in, in pretty minimal lines of code. I, I think it's worth us actually building this system. So uh, this is not a live coding demo or anything. This is the only code slide, I promise. Uh, but this is legitimately what was running in production for a client, right? It's less than 40 lines of code. And we were able to build this entire dynamic image resizing system. Uh, people could ask for any size of image they wanted from a CDN, and they were able to get back that image. Um, now you'll notice there's like a lot of like logic that just isn't here. Like, okay, how are you how are you checking for if the image already exists? Um, how are you checking for all of that? Well, we were able to sit on top of a lot of platform services that already existed, right? So we used the content distribution network, CloudFront, and it would actually go and point to an S3 bucket, blob storage, and say, hey, is this thing here? If not, we actually leveraged a cool little trick inside of S3 where on the miss of an image, we could just redirect to API Gateway. Once we got to API Gateway, of course, we could run a Lambda function. So that Lambda function literally uh, ran that 40 lines of code that you saw before, and we were able to have a pretty sweet uh, dynamic image resizing system with 40 lines of code. Uh, there was, of course, some, some infrastructure as code managed in there, but our total cost of ownership was super, super low. In fact, our bandwidth bill, uh, the first month that we ran this, cost more than the engineering time it took me to build this, uh, which is saying something, right? We were able to build something for pretty cheap. Now, if I were to build this today, I would say uh, this is a fail. Not because it's not technically uh, capable of working, it works fantastic and it's still working today. It does billions of requests today. Uh, but I'm not sure if I would actually take this approach again. And the reason being, uh, rule number two of kind of the serverless builder's creed, which is if the market has it, buy it. Um, as this system has, has grown, that 40 lines of code has grown tremendously because people started recognizing, oh, there's value in this. This image resizing system is bringing us lots of excellent capabilities, but now I want to put a watermark on the image. Now I want to grayscale it. Now I want to do all of these additional things to that image. And the engineering time that has gone into that, that has gone into improving it, well, it probably would have paid for at this point one of the like 500 different image media management solutions out there. So we sh I, at this point, I wish we would have just had looked at the market and said, is this thing going to address our needs right now and then also our future needs? So if the market has it, buy it. <clears throat> the third thing I want to talk about is real-time bidding. So we sat down with a client and they said, hey, we have this new project coming up. Uh, we have an existing bidding system where people are bidding on fairly expensive assets, uh, 3,000 plus US dollar assets was like the minimum price of something that was on the service. And we have lots of vendors that are bidding on these assets and they're trying to buy them. So we sat down in a room and we said, okay, give us your business requirements. What are your requirements for this application? And they said, well, it has to support, you know, hundreds or thousands of concurrent bidders. Uh, it has to have sub-second end-to-end bids, right? Uh, meaning if someone does a bid uh, here in Berlin on an asset and someone uh, is sitting on their computer in the United States where I'm from, they need to be able to see within a sub-second latency that that bid has gone through and it updates their browser. So people can have these crazy bidding wars with each other and they're just seeing these real-time updates. Uh, it had to allow for the easy addition of other services, right? So if they wanted fraud checks, bot detection, um, pull history of a bidder to see if they're within their uh, asset bidding limits for the, the day or the week or things like that. Analytics so they could drive better decisions. So we sat down and said, okay, uh, this is kind of complicated, but let's talk about it, right? Let's see if we can build an architecture that can address this with serverless. Um, the initial... Uh, things that they had brought to us were Kubernetes and, and Kafka and all sorts of crazy stuff. We said, well, let's put the brakes on for a second. Let's see if we can do this with serverless. So this is our initial architecture. Uh, clients were uh, communicating with API Gateway to a Lambda function, to a Kinesis stream. If you're ever building kind of like a real-time system uh, or a streaming system, Kinesis is awesome. Uh, it, it's super scalable, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of events per second, totally possible through Kinesis. So we had built this whole system and we prototyped it. Uh, 
stuff would come into API Gateway, the Lambda function would trigger, check a user data store to see, is this user valid? Can we add some additional metadata about this user as we put it on the stream? Uh, we had an example of a fraud detection service with a bot. So off of the first Kinesis stream, we would do all sorts of other interactions with these, this future service box. We had some prototypes. We did all of this bid processing. So there was a problem. Our P95 uh, of performance was about 1.2 seconds. And that's because we had, and that was from end to end uh, in, in various regions. And that was basically said, the developer said, no, this is completely unacceptable. We are going to run servers because we have sub-second requirements. So we sat down, uh, myself and a couple other people uh, at Trek 10, and said, OK, let's get all of these metrics in place. Let's, let's form, essentially, a war plan. And, and like Aragorn charging into battle, we were going to go to the business owners and say, you know what? Let's do it. Let's fight. Let's talk about this. Um, because we're going to make serverless work for you, whether you like it or not. So we had this interesting experience of sitting in the room with the developers and the business owners. Uh, and we said, OK. So we built this system for you. Here's what it looks like. It's massively scalable. It can perform for thousands of concurrent bidders. Uh, they click a button, someone bids, and it goes through. And someone might see it, usually in like 600 to 700 milliseconds was about the average. But there's like a P95 of about 1.2 seconds. So not super, not super slow, uh, but also not what we were told by the developers. So we put this in front of the business owners. And then the one question we asked him was, so what's it look like today? What does this process look like today that we have sub-second latency requirements uh, on the future version of this system? And they, they kind of all hemmed and hawed around the room and they said, yeah, so they just like push refresh on their browser and then they see the new bid. So we're like, uh, so it was like five seconds, like how long does that page even take to load? And they're like, yeah, we, we don't know. So really, uh, Architecture was awesome. The requirements were a fail, right? So what the the someone had just arbitrarily said sub second latency requirements because I need Kafka for my resume. Uh, so basically, my my next takeaway and my next rule of of the serverless builders creed is if you can reconsider those requirements, do it, right? If if you can challenge what people have told you in terms of their business requirements, say, do you really need 50 milliseconds of latency? Do you really need a second of latency? Tell me your actual requirements. Um, and if those are truly requirements, what are you willing to pay to get there? So this is probably one of my, my biggest tools that I have when I'm talking with organizations and trying to promote serverless. Right? Let's talk about your business requirements. Let's face reality. And then let's say, OK, are you willing to spend 10 times more to get to 10% better um, performance? Usually the answer is no. So there are tons and tons of serverless use cases. Uh, Basically, all of this I've, I've built in production. Uh, I have applications with various clients that uh, we're doing billions and billions of requests uh, uh, per month. And, and all of these are completely valid. IoT is especially amazing for the serverless uh, capabilities. So my final takeaway is, look, I get it. Not everything is a platform service. Not everything is on the market. And you definitely can't always reconsider those requirements and negotiate with those business holders. So if you have to build it, I want you to own it. At this point, this is truly what I would consider your special sauce. This is your business. This is your business logic. This is the thing that sets you apart from everybody else. And if you're going to build it, I want you to build it correctly, the right way, the first time, and make sure that you take ownership in that and you're proud of what you're building. So that's the serverless mindset, is really, this is where your value is. Focus on your value. And if you're going to build it, I want you to absolutely own that particular thing. I want CI, CD in place. I want testing wrapped around it. And I want you to make sure that this thing is able to stand out there on its own in a serverless fashion. So serverless first. I have a design. Can you make it serverless? If you tell me no, try harder. Try again. And then finally, when we can get to that yes, 
do it. So thank you. My name is Jared Short, and this is the Service Spice Hut. <laughs>